Um, I'm actually I'm thrilled to be here. Um, for those of you that follow my work, you know that I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of what happens here at University of Mary Washington. I say nice things about your school all the time to people when I talk. So it's actually great to be able to actually come and spend some time in classrooms today and talk to students. Um, but I think the talk I'm going to deliver is probably not such a nice thing, not about you, hopefully. Um, hopefully when I talk about other people, um, you are not involved. Um, this is actually the last public talk, I, I hope, I think, um, that I'm giving this year. And I'm, I'm uh, interestingly, it was one of the most difficult for me to prepare. I mean, I put a lot of myself, right, my ideas, obviously, my anecdotes from my life um, into my talk. So when I was asked to speak about gender and technology, um, it was sort of strange to find myself at a loss of how much of me I really wanted to put into the, into the talk tonight, how much I wanted to include, how much of others' experiences I felt comfortable about um, invoking as well, particularly at this, at this moment um, online. I have lots to say, um, don't get me wrong, I have um, personal experiences as being a woman that works in technology. I have a women's studies degree, right? I'm actually officially sanctioned to talk about gender, I think. Um, but to speak about this right now, at this particular moment, right, in person, whether online or offline, to commit these thoughts to writing, to take a stand and to say what's going on is wrong, um, it's a little intimidating at the moment. Partially because when you say this word three times, a monster appears, right? Just like Beetlejuice. Right. I'm not even going to repeat it three times because that's how frightening it is. No, I'm kidding. It's not. They're not frightening. Um, but there is this fallout right now online for women in particular around Gamergate and around what this past week is now called Shirtgate um, that are really wreaking havoc, wreaking havoc on people's lives. And I think I'm pretty fierce and fearless. Um, but I have to admit, like, I sort of stared at the blinking cursor, trying to figure out what I should say, um, and feeling sort of a little apprehensive about the reaction um, to, what, to what I would say, particularly sort of if I call out certain isms, if I name certain names, then, you know, the monster, the monster appears. Um, but I have to say it, right? I have to say it because so few people in education technology actually will. And that is that there's a problem with computer technology, right? There's a problem culturally and ideologically. There's a problem with the internet. Um, it's largely designed by men from the developed world for men for the, of the developed world, right? Men of science, men of industry, right? Military men, venture capitalists, despite the hope and the hype that, um, that these tools were going to sort of have be revolutionary, that they were going to provide access and opportunity to everyone, they don't, right? And they actually don't negate hierarchy, they don't negate history, they don't dismantle power, they don't dismantle privilege, right? In some ways they reflect those. They actually channel those, right? They concentrate that power in new ways and in old ways. And it's important, I think, to sort of recognize that um, harassment of women, of people of color, of marginalized groups is really pervasive online. It's a reflection of offline harassment, for sure, right? Um, but there are these mechanics of the internet, right? It's architecture, it's infrastructure, it's culture that can sort of alter and I think even exacerbate what the harassment looks like and the way in which people experience it online as well. And I think for those of us that work in education technology, myself included, those of us that want to advocate for students in particular to use these tools, that's a really bitter pill to swallow, right? That internet technologies are not actually always necessarily generative, right? That they're not always supportive, right? That they can actually be destructive. Um, but I think that this is an education technology issue. This is a technology issue. It's an education issue. It's a societal issue. Certainly it's a political issue, but we can't ignore it, right? And I think that that's precisely what a lot of the people in education technology seem to do. And in my head, I can hear the voice, 
and it's certain voices, right, that say, so a response from sort of certain corners of the internet that say, well, that's just your opinion, lady. Um, and it totally is. It totally is my opinion, right? All my work conceivably falls under the headline opinion. I get that. It's my analysis. That's the term I would use. Um, I think it's grounded in research. I think it's grounded in observation. I think it's grounded in my experience, yes. Um, and sometimes I do talk about personal experience narratives when I, when I, when I speak about technology. Um, sometimes as a way to sort of ground my authority in a field in which I do not actually have a formal degree and I'm not formally employed. So, like I said, when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I sort of recognized that I felt like um, quite vulnerable. Um, and it's not actually an intellectual vulnerability. It's, um, which sometimes I think I feel quite often, like the thing when you're like ready to push publish on a blog post that you wrote, and you're like, maybe that's dumb, right? <laughs> Or maybe I'm totally wrong, or maybe this thing that I think is actually really smart and insightful, someone else made like last week and they wrote about it much more intelligently. Or someone wrote about it two years ago, or five years ago, or a decade ago, and this thing that I've discovered, actually everyone else knows but me, and I'm gonna look like an idiot. I get that all the time in my head, that it's like imposter syndrome, right? Um, but I'm talking about a different sort of vulnerability, right? If you're familiar with this movie, you should perhaps consider watching it. It's sort of, not simply intellectual, but it's psychological, right? And it's physical as well. And that is a reminder that my work comes from a body, right? My body, it's a marked body, right? It's gendered, and therefore it's never seen as objective, right? I'm always subject, I, subjective, I always have an opinion. It's gendered, right? That's the lens through which I write. That is how I experience the world, right? A white heterosexual American female, and that is how I experience the internet. So there's a very famous New Yorker cartoon, perhaps you're familiar with, that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. The, the cartoon was first published in 1993, which is really interesting because it sort of marks that already in the early 90s, that the notion of the internet was popular enough that, well, that readers of the New Yorker could joke about it. So make of that what you will. <laughs> but, um, but, but it also is sort of shows to us that for a very long time now, we've had this idea that the internet provides us with privacy and anonymity. And it allows us to be this place where we can experiment with our identities online, right? In ways that are severed from our body, right? From our material selves and potentially at least we can sort of participate on the internet in ways that we can't actually in the offline world, right? That dog is able to do things on the internet that he wouldn't be able to do offline, perhaps. But I think that there's that moment, right, when folks on the internet discover that you're a dog, right? And they do everything in their power to put you back in your place, to remind you that you have a body, to punish you for being there, to punish you for speaking, to hurt you, to destroy you, right? And it's online and it's offline. So the following sentence I'm gonna say is so weird and when I utter it, it's like it sounds, it sounds strange for me to even say it, but I've received death threats. Like I write about education technology for a living. I write online and I've received death threats. I've had people respond to my work by saying I, they wanted to kill me, they wanted me to die, right? I've had death threats, rape threats, um, subtle and overt. Most of the time I get what my friend uh, Tressie McMillan Cottom describes as who the fuck do you think you are comments, right? Those are people that suggest that I should shut up, right? I've been harassed, I've been threatened, some is sporadic, some is serial. In response, I've taken the comments off my blog, which means then they email me the threats. It happens on platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Google, so I block, I delete, I flag as spam, but it's up to me to monitor this, right? It becomes, of the, it becomes part of the work that I have to do um, to do my work 
online. I've filed complaints, I've filed reports to the social media platforms, but rarely did they respond. When I tell people that these are my experiences, they often say like, well, are the threats real? Um, and that's a hard question <laughs> to answer because yeah, nobody has come knocking at my door, thankfully, right? But they're real, they are real. I experience these threats as real. Right? Even if nobody physically hurts me, these threats are very material. They take a toll on me, right? They affect my work, my mental health, my physical health, my relationship with my partner, they affect my life. Um, so for a long time I wondered like, what is it about me that's so controversial? I mean, I'm a nice person. I sometimes say things that are a little, little sharp-edged, but what is it about me? And like I hear that actually from helpful men on the internet that tell me that if I would just sort of soften it up, right, that I wouldn't be treated this way, right? If I would say more nice things, right, if I would smile, that's why I have that shark face, that big shark smile in my avatar on Twitter. And it's true, like I said, my work is sometimes critical, sometimes bitingly so. Um, but you know, I've come to realize that these threats, the threats and the harassment are not at their core about the content of what I write. They're not about the substance of any of my arguments are pretty, they're pretty good. Um, they're not actually about tech or ed tech or God forbid ethics in video game journalism, right? They are because I'm quite simply a woman, right? I'm a woman who expresses opinion on the internet, right? I'm, I'm a woman. One of my very favorite essays is by the writer Rebecca Solnit, um, Men Explain Things to Me. It's the inspiration for for the title of this talk. She wrote this essay first in 2008, and since then the word, the term mansplaining has become really popular and widely used. We often use it to describe this experience, right, where on the internet, where men explain things to women. Um, she actually published a whole book on the topic earlier this year. Mansplaining is what I would call a microaggression, right? It's a practice of undermining women's intelligence, their contributions, their voice, their experiences, their knowledge, their expertise. And frankly, once these pile up, these sort of mansplaining microaggressions, they really do un begin to undermine a woman's feelings of self-worth. And then I think, and the purpose is, women choose not to speak. I'm gonna quote from her essay at length, partially because it's so marvelous. Um, so she says, I was in Berlin giving a talk when the Marxist writer Tariq Ali invited me out to dinner that included a male writer and translator and three women a little younger than me who would remain deferential and mostly, mostly silent throughout the dinner. Tariq was great. Perhaps the translator was peeved that I insisted on playing a modest role in the conversation. But when I said something about how women strike for peace, the extraordinary little known anti-nuclear and anti-war group founded in 1961 had helped to bring down the Communist Hunting House Committee on Un-American Activities, or HUAC, Mr. Very Important II sneered at me. Right. HUAC, he insisted, didn't in exist by the early 1960s, and anyway, no women's group played such a role in HUAC's downfall. His scorn was so withering, his confidence so aggressive, that arguing with him seemed a scary exercise in futility and an invitation to more insult. I think I'd written nine books at that point, including one that actually drew on primary documents and interviews about women's strike for peace. But explaining men still assume that I am in some sort of obscene impregnation metaphor, an empty vessel to be filled with their wisdom and knowledge. A Freudian would claim to know what they have and I lack. But intelligence is not situated in the crotch, even if you can write one of Virginia Woolf's long, mellifluous musical sentences about the subtle subjugation of women in the snow with your willy. Back in my hotel room, I Googled a bit, 
and found that Eric Bentley in his definitive history of the House Committee on American Activities credits Women's Strike for Peace with, quote, quote, striking the crucial blow in the fall of Huax Bastille in the early 1960s. So I opened an essay for the nation with this, inter with this interchange in part as a shout out to one of the more unpleasant, unpleasant men who have explained things to me. Dude, if you're reading this, you're a carbuncle on the face of humanity and an obstacle to civilization. Feel the shame. The battle with men who explain things, has trampled down many women of my generation, of the up-and-coming generation that we need so badly, here and in Pakistan and Bolivia and Java, not to speak of the countless women who came before me and who were not allowed into the laboratory or the library or the conversation or the revolution or even the category human. After all, Women's Strike Work for Peace was founded by women who were very tired of making the coffee and doing the typing and not having any voice or decision-making role in the anti-nuclear movement of the 1950s. Most women fight wars on two fronts, one for whatever the putative topic is and one simply for the right to speak, to have ideas, to be acknowledged, to be in possession of facts and truths, to have value, to be a human being. Things certainly have gotten better, but this war won't end in my lifetime. I'm still fighting it, for me, for, my, for myself certainly, but also for all those younger women who have something to say in the hope that they will get to say it. Rebecca Solnit, awesome, awesome writer. I think thanks to feminism, right, thanks to feminist pedagogy, sometimes we can, we can recognize when these incidents of mansplaining occur in academia, and oh my, they do occur in academia, right? Or when they occur in the classroom, right? We can see what happens when a young woman or a person of color perhaps some, has something terrifically smart to say, right? Whether it's based on their research, their analysis, their personal experience, and a man will interrupt and interject and explain whatever the topic is more loudly to them. Explain their personal experiences back to them. More forcefully with all the assuredness, right? And all of that well actually, um, that comes with male privilege. I hope, I hope that as educators, we try to sort of elevate the marginalized voices in our classroom, but online, we don't do that very well. I think the mansplaining is actually pretty overwhelming. And I speak from experience. I have on Twitter, I have over 26,000 followers, most of whom follow me, I think, maybe, because from time to time, I tend to say smart things about education technology. But regularly, regularly, men, strangers mostly, but not always, jump into my app mentions to explain education technology to me, right? To explain how open source licenses work, or open data, or open education, or MOOCs. Men explain learning management systems to me. Men explain the history of education technology to me. Men explain privacy and education data to me. Men explain venture capital how venture capital works of education startups to me. They explain online harassment to me. That's always my favorite. <laughs> um, men explain how blogging works to me and what it means to be a blogger, right? Men explain, they explain, they explain, and it's exhausting, right? It's exhausting and it's insidious. And it doesn't quite raise to the level of harassment, to be sure, but these microaggressions sort of, they mean that sort of when harassment and threats do happen, like we're already worn down, right? And this is all sort of part of my experiences online, um, women's experiences and, and my friends' experiences. As I was designing the slides and I decided to do different slides because I actually couldn't like come up with um, something directly related to, to this, I thought maybe I would just make a list of all of the women who are my friends, my peers, who've experienced online harassment in the last year or so. So I started to like, you know, run through the names. Adria, Sarah, another Sarah, a different Sarah, Brianna, Shanley, Suey, Tressie, Jesse. Online harassment, right? This is online harassment. Different Julie, Rose, Ariel, Anita, Kathy, Zoe, Amanda, Ash, Catherine, Felicia, Mickey, Mia, Molly, Lauren, Jen, a different Jen, another Jen, Jessica, Jesse, Jess, Caroline, Katie, Sadie, Bridget, Alyssa, Lindy, Rebecca, Roxanne. I could go on. I could go on. 
I should be clear, for many of these women too, for this harassment has moved offline as well. They've been doxxed, for example. That's where your address and um, phone number and other identifiable, inf identifiable information about your physical world is posted offline I'm um, in forums like 4chan for the specific purpose of offline harassment. So take the actress Felicia Day, for example, who recently posted her thoughts about Gamergate. Um, what's become this ongoing campaign, right, of harassment against women in gaming. She said, I've tried to retweet a few of the articles I've seen dissecting the issue in support, but personally, I am terrified to be doxxed for even typing the words Gamergate. She said, I've had stalkers and restraining orders issued in the past. I've had people show up at my doorstep when my personal information was hard to get. To have my location revealed to the world would give an entry point for a few mentally ill people who have fixated on me and allow them to show up and make good on the kinds of threats that I've received that make me paranoid to walk around a convention alone. I haven't been able to stomach the risk of being afraid to get out of my car in my own driveway because I have expressed an opinion that someone on the internet did not agree with. How sick is that, she said. Almost instantly after she posted this, almost instantly, she was doxxed, right? Her physical address was posted online. Almost instantly. And that's how increasingly how it works. You disagree with someone online and you're doxxed. Um, for many of these women, and myself included, our profession, our work actually demands we be online, right? We're writers and we're artists and journalists and actors and speakers and educators and students, right? We cannot not be online. And I think it's easy for some people to suggest that many of us are targeted because we have a higher profile, right? And we are, I think, maybe, perhaps, somewhat more easily recognizable, perhaps, but that's beside the point. Because one of the things that comes with being internet famous, which, yay, internet famous, um, is that, you know, as a higher profile internet user, you actually then start to have more powerful connections to people at, say, Twitter or Tumblr, so that when something happens to you, your complaints are elevated and dealt with the c accounts that attacked you perhaps are shut down, um, and your harassers are sort of addressed more rapidly than what user, regular users will ever experience. And regular users do indeed experience online harassment. The Pew Research Internet Project recently published the results from a survey of online harassment. Among the findings, 60% of internet users say they've witnessed someone being called an offensive name. Um, 53% have seen efforts to purposefully embarrass someone. 25% say they had seen someone being physically threatened. 25%, one in four, so right. 24% have witnessed someone being harassed for a sustained period of time. 19% say they witnessed someone being sexually harassed. 18% they had sent, 18% say they had witnessed someone being stalked. According to that same survey, 22% of all users, internet users, say that they have been harassed. One in five. Right? About half of those, a little over half of those, say they were the less severe forms of harassment. But 45% say that they have experienced the more severe, the more severe forms, right? Serial harassment, sexual harassment, stalking. Young women, those age 18 to 24, what we still sort of label as college age, they experience the most severe forms of harassment online. 26% of young women online say they have been stalked. 25% say they have been the targets of online sexual harassment. And again, this, the, the information in this Pew survey is self-reported, so I think we can sort of question perhaps what that means. And so when, they, when, the Pew, when Pew says, men are somewhat more likely than women to experience harassment. I think we should probably remember that the harassment that men and women experience online is very different in degree and in purpose and intended results. A different organization, um, the Working to Halt Abuse Online, has found that 73% of cyber stalking victims are women. A University of Maryland study, a research project created fake accounts 
um, sent them into internet chat rooms. The ones with feminine usernames incurred an average of 100 sexually explicit threats in a day. The ones that had masculine names, So again, I think I want to make this link back to our bodies, our offline bodies, because an earlier Pew survey said too that 5% of women who use the internet say that something happened to them online that led them to feel physical, led them into physical danger. And again, the World Health Organization reminds us that violence against women is widespread around the world. 35% of women worldwide have experienced either intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Women who've been physically and sexually abused have higher rates of mental health issues, unintended pregnancies, abortions, miscarriages than non-abused women. Increasingly, in many conflicts, sexual violence is used as a tactic of war. So we, don't expect, we do not escape our bodies when we go online. Right? as much as that New Yorker cartoon suggests we might. In fact, I want to argue that computer technologies online, the internet, they actually reinscribe our bodies in ways I don't think we often talk about. Sort of the power and the ideology of gender and race and sexual um, orientation and national identity, in part because of who is building these tools. So for a couple of years now, news organizations have been trying to get the major technology companies to say who works for them. What does your workforce look like? And in fact, many of these companies have fought, have fought attempts to publish their EEO, the Equal Employment Opportunity Data. You're required by law to report this data. Um, this year, perhaps recognizing that at some point, the technology companies are going to have to talk about the pipeline issue. Um, how they're going to get more women and people of color into the STEM fields. Some of the major tech companies have released the data about who works for them, and it is not pretty. 70% of Google's employees are male, 61% are white, 30% are Asian. Of Google's technical employees, 83% are male, 60% of those are white, and 34% of those are Asian. 70% of Apple's employees are male, 55% are white, 15% of are Asian, 80% of Apple's technical employees are male, 69% of Facebook's employees are male, 57% are white, 34% are Asian. Do the math on that one. Right? 85% of Facebook's technical employees are male. 70% of Twitter employees are male, 59% are white, 29% are Asian, 90% of Twitter's engineers are male. So I wonder, gee, I wonder why viol blocking violent harassers, reporting rape threats, banning sock puppet accounts, and so on hasn't been a priority for the engineering team. And I wonder too, I, I, I'm genuinely curious what the demographics look like for education technology companies, right? What percentage of those who are building the ed tech software that we use are, are men? What percentage of them are white? Right? What percentage of the engineers that work at the learning management system companies, for example, are men? How do these bodies shape what gets built? Right? How do the privileges and ideologies, expectations and values get hard-coded into the technology we use? You know, I think we view education as a female profession. Certainly at the K through 12 level, three quarters of teachers are women over 80% are white, which is, it's worth pointing out that this year for the first year, um, minority students actually out, nor minority, I have to put, well, minority students outnumber white students in public schools. 80% of teachers are white. The higher education level, um, less than half of college instructors are women, again, overwhelmingly white. But I think it's still a mistake to talk about education as a female dominated profession, right? That, um, women aren't necessarily well represented in leadership roles in education, in decision making roles. Um, and I think we have to talk about the ways in which women do experience work related harassment in the education field, right? Um, and then recognize once we add that to technology to that, that the picture somewhat gets worse. Again, what percentage of education technologists are men? 
What percentage of education technology leaders are men? What percentage of education technology consultants? Those who make a living traveling, talking about education technology? What percentage of education CIOs and CTOs? What percentage of ed tech CEOs? Again, these bodies, like I said, their privileges, their ideologies, their expectations, their values, how do they influence the technology that gets built? Um, so I'm speaking to a group of students and educators here. So like, I think that means I'm supposed to say something like what we can do about this, right? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, we're, like, I'm not supposed to just like leave you all with like, shit, I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, you know, what can we do to resist that hard coding? What can we do actually to subvert it? Um, what can we do to make sure that the technologies that our students, all of us, use really can be wielded in ways that are actually progressive and not horrifyingly awful? Right? What can we do to make sure when we say to students, oh, your assignments involves you being online, that we haven't sort of triggered half the classroom with fears of abuse and harassment, um, exposure, death threats. And I think that the answer can't simply be that we can tell women to not use their real name online, right? Particularly if we're making the argument that participating online means that students and educators are building a digital portfolio or building out their professional network or contributing to scholarship, then we have to really think about whether saying use a pseudonym is a sufficient or equitable response. And I think we can't say, well, just don't blog on the internet or keep everything within the safety of the walled garden, right? Just do it all inside the learning management system. If nothing else, I think that this presumes that what happens inside siloed online spaces is somehow safe. I've seen plenty of really horrible behavior on closed forums from professors and from students alike. I've seen really heavy-handed moderation where questioning voices and marginalized voices are deleted. Um, I've seen forums where there's zero moderation and questioning voices and marginalized voices are mobbed. So the an and the answer can't really to tell people don't read the comments. Um, I would actually go one step further and think maybe it's come time that we actually rethink comments on the internet altogether, particularly rethink comments on student blogs altogether. Do, should we expect students to have to host comments on their blog, to moderate comments on their blog, right, to respond to comments on their blog. If we give students the opportunity to own their own domain, which is, I think, one of the most important things that is happening in education technology right now, to have their own space on the web, I don't know if we should require them to let anyone else into that space, right? Anyone that can create a user account gets to come into your domain. I don't know. I think it's perfectly acceptable to say to someone who wants to leave a comment on your blog post to like go respond on your own blog, right? I don't think you're under any obligation to hold someone else's, to host someone else's thoughts in your own domain. And I think that that sort of starts to get at some of the things I think are sort of moving towards us addressing this unpleasantness is sort of by design, we've ended up with these technologies that look a certain way, right? And I think that we can think about how to build something different. And I think we have to think about what that looks like socially, right? How to be nicer human beings, perhaps. But also, what does that look like technically? Um, you know, as I said, like the current shape of education technologies and social technologies are sort of shaped by these ideologies, by certain engineers, right? And we don't have to, we don't have to be, we don't have to accept that. It doesn't have to look that way. We don't have to do tech a certain way because that's how it's always been done. We can design differently, right? We can design around things. We can use technology differently. We can sort of use around these systems. I think one of the interesting examples of this that sort of combines a dual approach 
that's both technological and um, social, it's outside the realm of ed tech, um, is Blockbot, which is a Twitter application. And sort of having grown weary of the constant stream of abuse online, a group of, um, and, and Twitter sort of refusal to deal with it. Um, a group of feminist developers wrote this tool called Blockbot. It's an application that when you installs it, lets you block en masse a large list, a sizable list of Twitter accounts who are known for being serial harassers. The list of blocked accounts is updated collaboratively, right? It's a community effort. And there's also a tool that lets you, a similar tool that lets you block a series of IP addresses that are known from coming from places that are also serial harassers. So you don't have to have someone even be able to access your site. This gets a sort of a little bit of you know what I'm what I'm thinking about here in order to make education technology be sort of habitable, right? Sustainable. It's not like the internet as it is currently is not habitable and it is not sustainable for me. It is not healthy. I think we have to rethink the technology, right? It's not really either like this nostalgia for a web we lost. I think it has to be a move forward for a web we've yet to see, right? I think it has to be inclusive and it has to be equitable. And I think that, you know, education technology probably needs to be reminded of this as well. That we don't actually have to s adopt tools in education technology that serve business goals or that serve administrative goals, particularly when they are the detriment to scholarship and to students. Um, I don't think we have to adopt technologies that are going to surveil students and control students and restrict access to things under the guise of safety. That's going to be the f administrator's first goal, right? Well, we'll just protect stu students, right? We'll just protect, we'll just protect students from things. That's really not meeting students' needs at all. It's not recognizing that students have agency. Um, I don't think we, we think we have to recognize that technology doesn't actually have to extract value from us. We don't have to accept technology that puts us at risk, right? We don't have to accept that the architecture, the infrastructure of these tools make it easy for harassment to occur without any consequences. We can build different tools. We can build better technology, right? We can build them with and for our communities for communities of scholars, for example, for communities of learners. We don't have to be paternalistic. We don't have to protect students from the internet as though we're going to like trot out all of the stranger danger warnings um, once again from the 90s, right? That the internet is full of predators and pedophiles. That's not quite what I mean, but I think we have to recognize if we want education to be online, if we want sort of our civic and public lives to be online, if we want education to be sort of immersed in technology and technological and in information and networks, we cannot just throw students out there, right? We have to be braver. I think we have to be much more compassionate. And I think we have to build that into education technology. Um, like the Blockbot, this is, has to be something that's a collaborative effort that reflects the values that matter to us, right? that the te technology we build should reflect our values. Because I think that's the thing, right? The answer to this, to answer to harassment online, the male domination of the tech industry, it actually has to be us doing something. The answer isn't silence. That is, I think, what Rebecca Solnit reminds us, one of the goals of mansplaining, to get us to cower, to get us to hesitate, to get us to doubt ourselves to doubt our stories, to doubt our needs, to step back, and to shut up. So I repeat, like, the answer is not to be silent. So one more story, and this is actually, I think, the most important cautionary tale of recent months. Um, the most important cautionary tale about gender and equity and silence. And it's not actually from Gamergate, and it's not from Shirtgate. Um, but it's the revelations that came last month, and I'm not sure it's a story you'll be familiar with, about uh, Canadian radio celebrity John Gomeshi. Right? He was the host of a very popular radio show 
Um, he was suddenly fired by the CBC, and allegations quickly emerged about violent sexual assault. Gomeshi, for his part, said that this involved spurned ex-lovers. It's all his spurned ex-lovers, right? A lot of them teaming up together to destroy him. Um, he said he was being punished for what, in his words, were consensual BDSM. The women, and there are now over eight accusers, say otherwise. They say it was not consensual. They say it was assault. But it isn't just these women, these eight women, who've come forward about John Gomeshi. A huge number of members of the Canadian media and of the Vancouver music scene have spoken out too, and they confessed that they knew. They knew. There was talk, right? There was chatter. There were warnings whispered. One woman wrote a piece in which she explained carefully what, when people asked, do you know about John? The question didn't apply, do you know John Gomeshi, the popular radio host of the show Q? It meant, do you know? Do you know? Just be careful. He's weird with women, a male friend had warned her when she first joined the scene. And she wrote, I was warned by this. I kept my distance. I just watched and I saw the way he moved towards women, introduced himself, pushed his way into their space. Nothing you'd call a crime, not quite. Nothing you could name. Just a sense, all the little things that added up to say, this isn't safe. This person isn't safe. Boundary issues, we call them, right? They were persistent. I saw it on other occasions, though only a few other parties, where I might lean my head against another woman, woman's so that we could exchange our warnings in the night. Through these other women, I started to hear stories filtering through in little bites. It felt as though everyone had a friend with a story a friend who'd been hurt or leered at, a friend who'd been uncomfortable or cornered or afraid. But how could you say that? How could you say that in a way that you would ever be believed? How could you describe that for a world in the way that the world would ever believe? So instead, you just turn to the women around you and you say, do you know about John? And you watch them nod and they pass it on. And that's how networks work. Right? We exchange important information with one another. We try to build community. We try to build, keep our community safe. But I think that this anecdote around that sort of highlights the way in which power in these networks work as well, about what access to certain networks afford us. Networks can afford us protection, but if you aren't part of the right network, right, perhaps you didn't get the whispered warnings. Right? Perhaps you were part of an adjacent network, right? a network of powerful people who knew about John, but chose not to say anything or not to do anything. It's not a perfect analogy to EdTech by any means, but I want to draw the comparison here because I feel like the stakes are really high. Right? We have to think about what networks we're building, right? what networks we're using, how do they reflect information? But how do they reflect power? Who do they put, who do they protect? Who do our networks protect? And who do our networks put at risk? Because we can't actually sit back and let the harassment and abuse go on, because we know it goes on. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist or that because it's online, it's not real. We cannot retreat behind walls. Women, we know that violence happens there too, right? We know that being out in the public sphere offers us some affordance of safety at times. And I think it also means, in this day, being in the public sphere does mean being on the internet, that this is how we get to fully participate in civic life. So yeah, sure, we whisper the tips to our friends and our colleagues and students. I think we can work quietly and loudly to resist. We have to build alternate networks, right? We have to build alternate education technologies, but we have to do something and we cannot continue to be silent. Thank you.
So I guess I'll field some questions. Or we can all just like <laughs> go get a drink because it's <laughs> such an uplifting talk I just gave you. <laughs> yeah? Am I the only one who doesn't know what shirt day is? Oh, good. Good. No, good. Because it's. So last week, um, the European Space Agency landed a rocket on a comet awesome, amazing, humans are incredible, right? Um, but one of the rocket scientists on a day that sort of he knew all the cameras from all over the world would be turned on him and he would have a chance to speak, showed up to work wearing a shirt that had half-naked women wearing PVC armor in sexually suggestive clothing. And when folks were watching the live stream, um, a, a, a colleague of mine um, commented, ooh, like, inappropriate shirt. And since then has actually received death threats. Um, so this notion that, uh, that, so I think Shirtgate, much like Gamergate, is sort of this idea that sort of um, feminists are trying to like destroy everyone's fun by making people not ha play um, not play sexist video games and not wear naked lady shirts to work. So that's Shirtgate in a nutshell. The internet's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I know that's so awful. I mean, it, and I think that that's. I mean, I think that that's our ex that, that's our experience in harassment offline as well, right? Like, very. It's it's still very difficult to be taken seriously when you report any sort of harassment. Um, I think that one of the things that you can do, and this is actually something that um, that everyone should do, should do, is sort of um, beef up your security practices, right? Like, what would you do if if for whatever reason um, the angry hordes from 4chan decided to come at you tomorrow? Like what do you have in place to make sure that your world is secure? Do you use two-factor authentication, for example, like on your Gmail? Set that up. Set up two-factor authentication on Twitter. Set up two-factor authentication on all the apps that have two-factor authentication, right? Don't use the same password for everything, right? Um, have have a group of folks or you know and if like um, have a group of folks that you can turn to when when something happens and create a support network for each other um, I think that one of the things uh, one of the things that friends and I do that when a friend has a blog post for example that goes um, viral is to offer to moderate the comments for them just say like you don't like don't even look like don't look Ah, we'll, we will deal with that for you. I think that there has to be better sort of self-care, but for the first thing is like have your security ducks in a row so that people actually can like come at you, but they're not going to get access to your bank account, to your email, and sort of dismantle your digital life. That's such a weak-ass response. I mean, I wish that there was something better, I could say, like a bat signal that we put up, and, but yeah, sorry. You had, use your hand up, I was, yeah. I was pretty horrified by the John Dimeshi news, um, but one of the things that I found kind of heartening about it is that I, I would have never found out what not for Twitter. Um, you know, I don't follow that guy, I don't know who he is really, but the fact that people um, responded and, and responded, I think, very carefully, especially people like Dan Savage, mm -hmm. who tends to sometimes go a little nuts, and, and he was like, 
let's let's hold off, let's wait. Yeah. Um, I think that, that really helps people feel, I think, that, that they're heard and that, you know, the internet gets criticized a lot, and rightfully so, for being kind of a wild west. But at the same time, it helps, I think, many of us not feel alone. And so there's, um, I, I don't know that you can ever really control that, right? It's always going to be a wild beast. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that, I mean, I, th I, you know, there's the part of me that really, I mean, obviously, like, I work on, I work on the internet. I live on the internet. I spend most of my day on the internet. I sp spend most of my day on Twitter, and then until I, like, want to, like, hurl my computer out the, out the window and um, set it on fire and dance, dance on its ashes. Um, but, uh, I think that I mean I think that, that I think that in some ways this idea of the freedom um, and the sort of anarchic play and self-expression that the internet has afforded us um, is a positive thing, but I think that that it's not accessible to everyone in the same sort of way, and I I would hope that we could sort of sort of not romanticize not romanticize that until we sort of recognize the way in which the places that are the wildest west are the places that I think are still somewhat dangerous to be, particularly for, for women, for marginalized, for marginalized groups. I mean, I remember bringing up 4chan with my son and he was like, mom, don't go there. Like, don't, don't ever go to 4chan, which was kind of him to look out for me that way. But yeah, no, I would never, I would never, never go to 4chan. I don't feel like I could go to Reddit. Like it's the front page of the internet, and it's not a site I feel like I'm I feel comfortable being on, and that sucks. Like that sucks that the front page of the internet isn't welcoming. You know. So you already answered the question about what can we do from an individual point of view, from a more institutional or curricular point of view. What are some things that we can do to help students not only um, understand? Um, I mean, I think that part of it comes back to sort of these questions around security, right? These questions around what are the trade-offs that we're making when we sign up for certain sites? Or what happens to our personal data? What sort of, what sort of looks like, um, what sort of looks like freedom, which is actually sort of um, laying open your personal lives to be data mined. Um, I think that so there. I think that there are discussions about that. I think that there are um, thinking about, um, you know. I think that having a having a domain of one's own is a really important consideration, but I think that we sort of need to talk more about what that means and how that plays out for everyone as well, right? Sort of having your own space on the internet. I mean, it's the thing I advocate for it's the, all the time, but it, do, it looks differently for different people. And um, how do we talk about that? I mean, how do we talk about that the way we talk about um, ideology and sociology and gender in our other classes as well. How do we reflect that um, when we think about our digital our digital selves as well? I mean, I think that you know, I think that education is a is an important component to this. To look at to look closely at the tools that we use and recognize you know that they're not neutral. Right? Go when Google says they want to organize the world's information, I mean, bullshit. They want to like sell ads against our searches. Like they aren't—they aren't in some sort of like civic, civic gesture to sort of, you know, be the new library. I mean, this is—you know—we need to sort of ask more questions about the things that we're being sold technologically as being whiz bang solutions when they're not. Oh. So how do you feel about Wikipedia? Um, I have—I uh, think that Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia is great in theory in practice it's it's um, not so again not so fun necessarily to sort of be um, to 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 be to be part of that community which is again a minority very very small number of editors on Wikipedia are are women um, and we see the sorts of that there I mean I've heard all sorts of wonderful stats about this that there are like m entries for like minutia around the minutia around the minutia of like Iron Man's different costumes, right? That there are like pages and pages and pages about the different 
looks of the Pez dispenser. And when a woman decided to create a page about Kate Middleton's wedding dress, it was scheduled for deletion right away because it wasn't a worthy topic. I'm like, I got to tell you, like, I think the future Queen of England's wedding dress, it's at least as important as what Iron Man wears. Um, so I think that, you know, I mean, I think that that's the thing. We see this, so we see what the culture, what the culture values. We see what the culture wants. Um, and again, the, the sort of the way in which Wikipedia editors, bless their hearts, are very quick to come in and correct things that don't fit their, you know, fit the norms of, uh, nor their norms of their culture. Our culture, it's supposed to be our culture, like their culture. Yeah. You had, a, you had your hand up there. Oh, okay. I was like, are you an undergraduate? Are you an undergraduate? You're not a graduate student, right? Oh, you're a professor? Oh my gosh. You look... Really? What field are you in? Oh, maybe they are nice there. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I'm being flippant. I think that, I mean, I, I think so. I think that I think that humans are sort of not so nice to one another. I mean, look around, right? Like, you know, that things are sort of fucked up. Like, and humans did that. We did that to each other intentionally. I think online. I think that online, certain things, certain kinds of um, assholery gets like projected in different ways. But yeah, no. I. I mean, I. I think that, yeah. Sorry, that's a really like, Jim is like, people are great, Audrey, shut the hell up. No, go ahead. Yeah. Right. And of course, nor neither of schools, because of course, schools response, I mean, I think K through 12 response is like ban it. Right. right. So instead of having an interesting conversation about perhaps what um, Wikipedia is like, or an interesting conversation about YouTube comments, like I think a, a, a conversation about YouTube, com YouTube comments with 13 year olds would be a very important conversation to have. But instead, schools say, well, eh, we'll just make sure they can't get to YouTube while they're at school. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we make it easy to, to be that way, too. Sorry. That's what I sometimes, I mean, that's what I imagine. That's, that's what I like to think, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, like, one of the things that, that's always like, made me feel good about the internet was like this notion that, that when, we see, when we witness bad things on the internet, what it's really doing is exposing to us the bad stuff that's actually right. happening in real life. Like, like, there's some, like the harassment that women experience behind closed doors is very hard to respond to and do anything about because it's happening behind closed doors. But, Ironically, what's happening on Twitter, you can look at the mentions of people and you can witness this harassment. Yeah. Um, but I'm now starting to think that maybe I should feel comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. You know. So I'm terrified <coughs> by, by online bullying because my kid's five and like I think about that. Um, but like, you know, I never thought a lot about Felicia Day and now, man, I'm like, I'll give you my money. You know, like, right. you're a worthwhile role model for my kid, right. you know? Um, so I think, in, I mean, I think to a certain degree, seeing people people fight back in a mature, thoughtful way, I think, is really right. encouraging. 
like if, if the internet is providing us this kind of like window into what is sadly not a very great thing, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Like it's a painful thing to witness. And it is, yeah. It's a painful thing to work through and figure out, well, how do we make something, like how do we make this better? Right. Um, but harassment behind closed doors in my mind is far, far worse than harassment that's happening in the open. Even right. Even harassment in the open in some ways can feel even more terrifying. Yeah. Because now, you know, you're yeah. exposed and it's in a, in a new way, or right? I mean, I think that that's that's part of it too. Is I think that you know that these technologies are changing very quickly, and culture changes sort of slowly, um, and so I think that we're we are sort of experiencing this like this sort of disconnect where we feel as though these things are changing, and we haven't yet we certainly haven't developed um, a legal framework. Although I'm not sure I would suggest a legal framework is the answer, but we haven't developed policy. We haven't developed sort of laws, we haven't even developed sort of auto-responder emails, things that like let us address these things. They're happening really, really quickly. Yeah. In the back, yeah. Um, so, uh, I remember seeing a story about how many folks were just forced to sit for those uh, forced to hand their machines in their washer and go to concerts. And I think that was, you know, certainly constructive and certainly allowed people to hide behind that So I think I think that one of the important things that the internet does give us is that is that moment of being a, like no one knows you're a dog, right? That there's something really powerful about not having to reveal who you are online, because um, it's not just nasty trolls on YouTube that that are. Although I guess YouTube has got rid of their comments, but it's not just nasty trolls that that respond anonymously. I mean whistleblowers, for example, right? People who cannot attach their names to what they say because for, for, for really significant political reasons. So being anonymous online, I think, is, is important. What the, and the flip side of that, and this is what you know, amazes me as someone who gets um, very lengthy um, fan letters from people who make all sorts of threats under their real name. They have no, no problem signing an email from their work address telling me, you know, so I think that this idea that sort of attaching your real name to it gets rid of harassment um, isn't quite true. I think that some people for reasons of privilege or reasons of <laughs> kind of idiocy, um, you can decide, are perfectly happy to sort of still be jerks under their real name because they don't think that there are going to be any consequences. Did you want to follow up? I was just going to say maybe there's some more things that could just, you know, slow these cats and like sleep on their machines and make them sleep in their like, you know, areas that are like that are natural places. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, Yeah. Any of those consequences that the real life world may face. So, you know, it may seem that people are just like more, you know, cool and neat on the internet, but really it's just maybe that's maybe they need to stay in the bed. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I think that we hold both of these truths in our mind at the same time. One is that there's not a real body on the other side of the screen. Like, we pretend as though that we're actually just talking to user accounts. Like that, that's actually not a real person with real feelings um, on the on the other side of the computer screen. But then at the same time, I think that some people are very aware that there is a real person, and I think that there is um, sort of a concerted effort to hurt you, to fantasize about um, to fantasize about sort of about what happens to your physical body. And I think that we have both of those in our heads at the same time. That that. People aren't real online, and yet we know it's really real. Yeah. Thank you.
and it's not me, or how could that possibly be? We, you know, we're nice to each other, we're good to each other, we've known each other for years, our kids play soccer together, etc. And yet, there's an imbalance there, and there are people who are voiceless in, in the world of education technology. And I wonder if you have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of one of the things, particularly in in um, in education technology, and I think it's almost in any sort of workplace or um, regularly scheduled meeting environment, including perhaps the classroom, is that there are some voices who talk and talk, and I mean, it sort of gets at the mansplaining thing, but it's not always about mansplaining. It's just the, the, the person who takes up a lot of space verbally, time-wise, who always has something to say about something. And we don't do a lot of list people in particular, the, the, the chattier space taker-upper people should do a lot more listening. And I think that that's, that's the thing that we have to recognize in education technology is that there are certain voices that are always heard. Those voices are t attached to certain bodies oftentimes who, no matter where you go, they're the voices who are giving sessions, they're the voices who are presenting things, they're the voices who are sort of leading the discussion down certain paths. And I think it's um, important to sort of recognize when they've had their turn to speak, they need to shut up and let other, p other voices be heard. And I mean, I would probably phrase it more nicely than you need to shut up. Um, although with some people, I might <laughs> say that. I mean, I think, and I think that that's, you know, I think that that's, that's often, that's, I think, the first step. And it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a really difficult step for people to sort of recognize that they take up a lot of space and that they need to spend a lot more time listening to other people, that their thing isn't, their thing isn't the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned earlier in your presentation, like the fear of like publishing a blog post. And yeah. Really questioning, like, do I really know anything? Because it's one thing if someone harasses like you, and it's not okay. I'm just saying, but it's one thing if someone harasses you and like sends you a death threat. But it's another thing if someone harasses like your intellect and your perspective. And like, I know you have like merits and things like that, but I just like graduated high school. Like, I can't really. <laughs> I just, I wonder, so you wonder sometimes, like, maybe I don't know anything, like, I don't know. Oh, I don't know anything. Like, I make up everything. Like, I'm so full of shit, like, like, really. And I'm, but I'm actually pretty, I would be pretty happy for people to call me out on my ideas because, like, honestly, I would love to, like, have discussions and debates um, with, with people about the merits of ideas, right? But what happens really quickly is that it becomes less about the merits of the ideas and more about other weirdness as well. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, I think that that's actually one of the, the positive things about being able to publish our work online is that we do, ideally, in a perfect world, get feedback from people, from people who can say, wow, that's, like, have you read this other book? That's a really great insight. I'm totally stealing your idea. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, um, right, at the, or, you know, that we are able to engage with ideas together online outside our, you know, outside our face-to-face our face-to-face -face, um, interactions. I think that learning, in particular, is a really vulnerable position. Right? The process of learning does mean saying, like, I don't know this thing. Like, I don't know this thing, and that's OK, because I'm going to like work through it. But it is, it is a, vulner it's a vulnerable thing. And it's even more, I think, intimidating to, to sort of do that vulnerability on the internet. It's one thing to sit in a class and realize you're like, wow, everyone else is like, smart and um, they did the reading <laughs> and I didn't um, but it's something else to like do that thing online is is really scary which means you should probably do the reading you know but um, no I, t I totally I totally understand I, I think that like that's why we have to have more compassionate spaces so that when you post something online it's not as though that there are like sharks just waiting to like gobble you up and like destroy you we should be like yay <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Um, I think the solution would be to have more women in the workplace. I don't think that that's necessarily going to make everything um, wonderful. I mean, the perfect example of this is, you know, Margaret Thatcher was the leader of England, and it's not as though she was ever such a wonderful lady for women's rights. Um, no, I think that the answer is to have women there because, we, like, women are or in, in diverse voices because we ask the questions that. Um, we raise the issues that just aren't seen. One of the things that's amazing to me is that Apple came out with this new health app, right, that's like auto-installed on your phone and you can't delete. But they thought that it would be great if you could track all the things you'd want to track in order to be a healthy person, right? Like how much iron your iron intake, how many stairs you went up and down, how much you weigh, your body mass. The sorts of things that you know people who are sort of into fitness tracking would want to track that didn't include the menstrual cycle, which you know many women actually download apps to be able to track track that sort of thing. I can guarantee you there was it was all dudes on the health kit app building session because women would have said, you know what, you know what ladies like to track. <laughs> Maybe we should include that. And so I think that those, I mean, like those, that's a, might sound like a little thing, but I think it's things like that that get missed all the time when we don't have, when we don't have diverse voices building, a diverse people, a diverse set of bodies and voices at the table building technologies. The things that are like, oh yeah, duh, like, oh yeah, we, we totally, <laughs> we totally should have included that because you have a set of a sort of same group of people with the same sort of sets of circumstances that just, don't, they just don't think about it. So I think, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, a nice set of diversity training would be great for Twitter engineers. But I think having more women work at Twitter in the engineering department is probably our best bet. Um, so the history of computers is really interesting. Um, you know, the, the first computers were women, right? That, the word computer was used for the women who did sort of cleric, the clerical input putting of, of work into these machines that we eventually <coughs> called computers. And in fact, for a very long time, women participated in computer science. Um, Admiral Great, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, for example, um, invented um, COBOL. Uh, women have contributed, the first computer programmer was a woman. Women have contributed and been part of technology or computing technology for a really long time until the 80s when suddenly the number of women who were getting degrees in the field and pursuing the field sort of drastically fell off. Um, and I think that in Silicon Valley in particular, people get hired from within networks. Um, I think that people just, um, people in power that are making hiring decisions are looking for certain things and not recognizing that what they're sort of doing the pattern matching where um, an investor said, I would invest with, I heard an investor say, I would invest in anyone that looked like Mark Zuckerberg. I'm like, what the hell is that? Like a blonde kid that wears a hoodie and sandals, like really, like that's your standard of investing in people. But I think that that's the thing is like, you know, I know a good engineer when I see him, he looks like this. I'm like, oh, he does. Interesting. So I think that you know, women have have been in technology. I think that just um, we have to work a lot harder now on a diversity issue because women have left and women leave the profession in droves because it is sort of it's sort of um, an unpleasant place, unfortunately, it's unpleasant to work in technology. No, I mean, if you're going into technology as a woman, I mean, I totally support you and I'll have your back, I'll write you letters of recommendation, like you can call me and like, I'll like walk you through difficult times, but yeah, women leave the profession um, in droves. Mm -hmm. So even when you go into the classroom and look at people's time spent with emails and emails, it's the same amount of time, but there's subtle differences, right? 
right? Um, I think that it's, I think that there's some of that, com some of those conversations. I think that the, that the challenges as well are that the, the, the work culture, and again, I'm talking about the work culture of Silicon Valley, like particularly Silicon Valley startups, is so antithetical to leading like a sane and healthy human life that it makes it very difficult for people who have families, and I don't just mean women, I mean men or women that have families to participate in that world. Um, it makes it like people work ungodly amounts of hours expected to the, not, I mean, and not just sort of CEOs. I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg does not work ungodly hours. I'm sure he, he for his dollar paycheck, I'm sure he does about a dollar's worth of work. Um, but um, no, I'm sure he does great stuff. Um, <laughs> but I think that that culture is really not a place that's welcoming to family life. And I think that it's really challenging for women in particular to find, to find their way through that. Um, and I think that the, that the culture more broadly in the tech sector still tends to be something that rewards certain behaviors and people that look a certain way and have their lives organized in a certain way. Um, and I think that even, you know, even efforts like Sheryl Sandberg, for example, at Facebook, um, her efforts to sort of talk about lean in Right, her thing, it sort of feels like a very, like her work sort of feels like a very, um, again, it's a c incumbent upon women making their own change to make the f make work, make their own career paths different rather than addressing sort of um, systemic, systematic biases. And, and it's, I think Sheryl Sandberg's story in particular um, sort of is very much about what, about what white womanhood invokes and it doesn't really sort of recognize how that story look, might look very, very different for women of color. So that, I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. Were other questions about notions of identity that are kind of forming this, not only culturally, you know, but well, I guess culturally, but also virtually in relation to that, that we haven't really wrapped our head around and we're struggling with. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that in some ways, this that that sort of this notion of a of a virtual self where we can um, where we can sort of sever that from our physical world. To me, I'm not, like, it reminds me sort of of the work that, um, of Catherine Hale, right? And, like, there's this idea of, like, artificial intelligence of being that, right? That somehow we can take, um, we can sort of take what is a human intellect and then augment that virtually um, through, through machines. And I'm just not sure that the self is ever separate, sep we can ever sort of separate from the body. Um, I mean, I think that, 
you know, the, the idea of sort of the singularity where, where we eventually all get to be only digital, we get to sort of upload our consciousness into Google, I guess, um, is, is something that seems to me like very much a, f a fantasy of folks who haven't spent a lot of time recognizing the materiality of their, of their existence. Um, and I'm just not, sh I'm not, I'm not sure that, that there is that sever between the digital and the not, you know, I think that it's all us. I think that the virtual selves are still an extension of us. Even if we play with different identities, I think it is still, it is still us in our, in our physical, in our physical selves on the keyboard for starters, right? Yeah. I didn't mean to shoot you down there, but I totally did. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are my favorite.